Good morning. Good morning. I did not get my coffee break this morning, which is part of my contract. <laughs> so I hope it's not too unseemly that I brought coffee with me to the pulpit. But it is my pulpit, mine. <laughs> Where have you heard that before? Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of the lay leader today more than anything. So, And I know lay leaders bring coffee all the time because I see it, so it's okay. <laughs> Uh, well, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, everyone. By the way, great to have the choir back. Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> After a bit of a summer break, it's always wonderful to have you back in our services. So thank you, Deb. Thank you very much. And welcome to all of you to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing, liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world, or as we say in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. I want to begin this morning by welcoming all that you bring with you to this space, all of your unique beliefs, your background, your lifestyle, your experiences, your differences, all that helps make you who you are. This includes those of you who are joining us in person in the room here today, including those who might be joining us re more recently or for the first time, you're equally as welcome and appreciated. So welcome to one and all. Welcome to those of you who are streaming with us and Zooming with us uh, this morning. Great to have all of you with us too. You're an important part of our community as we begin to envision what our church is uh, within these sanctuary walls and beyond these sanctuary walls in our virtual sanctuary. So. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us from wherever you are. Uh, a couple of qu quick announcements. Well, just one quick announcement, really. Uh, if you will please mark your calendars for Sunday, October 23rd for our Fall Harvest Dessert Potluck on Sunday following the second service, the 11 o'clock service. So understand the term potluck which means you have to help make the dessert and you get to help eat it. And you can also bring a sack lunch for yourselves or your family too if you want to do that at that time as well. But uh, that sounds really delicious. So uh, for those who are not as concerned about the health issues of glycated sugar in your blood system, uh, just no. <laughs> Actually, uh, set all that aside for that day and enjoy some, some beautiful sweets made by friends. Okay, I do want to uh, especially welcome uh, those who are Zooming with us this morning. We have, uh, this is kind of a historical day. For the, for the first time in our church's history, we are going to have a guest speaker, Reverend Craig Morrow, who is going to deliver our message this morning via Zoom. And so it, it's, uh, it's a new use of the technology for us, and we're looking forward to uh, the wide door that you're helping us open today, Craig. I'm going to introduce Craig uh, more in just a moment, but wanted to also greet those of you who are Zooming with us. Uh, so far, this, this, uh, the, the Zoom service has only been going on during our first service. We get a lot of folks from more distant time zones who are, it's easier for them to attend. And we don't have somebody to host the second service. And I want to begin by thanking Terry Anderson, who really was the catalyst for getting this uh, going at our congregation. And Terry is the official host of the Zoom meeting. And he's decided to stick around, or actually agreed to stick around for our second service in order to, uh, to host for Craig. It looks like we have some, some extra folks who are jo joining us as well today. So. Uh, Terry, would you like to say uh, a couple of words and maybe introduce the folks who are uh, joining you? Uh, it looks like I'm one of them now that I look up there. But uh, <laughs> Hi, Terry. Yes, uh, you are. Um, well, Tom has joined us. I guess he normally attends in Spokane, but uh, for some reason he's uh, Zooming today, so that's nice. And John Smith is a, a good uh, Unitarian from Vancouver, but 
<laughs> He's looking a little blank right now, as, as you can see. So I'm not sure exactly uh, where he, he was here for the first service and had some interesting comments afterwards. So I, I don't know whether John just forgot to hang up or not. But anyways, uh, we didn't advertise this as being available, so it's not a surprise it's a smaller number. But we had a record attendance this morning of 17 people on Zoom. So uh, uh, I think it's because we've got great speakers. Well, thank you so much. I would agree, especially the, our guest speaker today, whom I mentioned, is Reverend Craig Morrow. He is a graduate of the University of Chicago and Star King School for the Ministry, one of our Unitarian schools. And he has lived and studied in India, Singapore, Thailand, the Netherlands, and Japan. He served in churches in California, Illinois, and the Pacific Northwest, including his most recent Y East in UU in Portland, from which he recently retired. And he's a founding member of the Tri-Cities Interfaith Alliance in Washington, and he currently lives in Portland, Oregon. Craig's sermons are often informed, as you're going to find out, <laughs> by readings in the original languages of religious texts, including Arabic, Hebrew, Tamil, and are known for blending scholarship with plain speech and a sense of humor. I know you're going to really enjoy his message coming up. And Craig has also been a supportive colleague and good friend of mine during these past three years. Uh, prior to that, other, outside of bumping into each other, we really hadn't known, gotten to know each other very much. Craig was one of the first uh, colleagues who really uh, showed up with a very loud voice, a very public voice, a very bold voice in support of me after my controversial book offering my dissenting opinions about the direction our liberal religion is heading uh, stirred up quite a bit of controversy. So I, I'm so happy that he's here, but as, I'm also indebted to him as a, as a supportive colleague and friend. I don't have as many as I used to. So I appreciate all those that I do, and especially those who, uh, who have... Uh, I, I've come to enter into relationship with in, in response to some of the uh, controversy around my existence. So Craig, would you like to, uh, to introduce yourself a, a bit more than that? Sure. Um, yeah, as Todd said, we didn't really know each other. We weren't like old buddies linking arms. I just thought, what the heck is going on where oh, they're attacking this person? And uh, did my best to try and uh, encourage uh, dialogue. Um, uh, I made some suggestions and tried to get them out to the colleagues, said, why don't we do this instead? Why don't we spend some time in reflection and then talk with each other? And uh, there wasn't much interest in that approach. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, as Todd said, this was a, we, we sort of fell into our friendship in the, in the, in the heat of battle, <laughs> or battlefield buddies. I'll also mention that the, the Tamil language um, uh, is the language of Kamala Harris's uh, mother. So uh, that's, that, that should be a point of interest. It's about the, it's probably sounded like a funny word to most of you to hear that, that language mentioned, but uh, it is the 13th most sp spoken language in the world, <laughs> with about 80 million speakers. <laughs> Craig, and real quickly, uh, some, something you don't put in the little bio that you distribute. Uh, you, you also have some really interesting woodworking skills and, and also uh, some martial arts expertise. I, yeah, I, thank you. Yeah, if you ever visit the Salem Church, you'll find uh, a pulpit carving and some large frames and some wooden music stands. The first time I spoke in Salem, people said, what's the cabinet maker doing in the pulpit? <laughs> That's how they'd known me. Uh, and then martial arts have been an important part of my life for many years. Uh, I do Chinese martial arts, which in a very meditative fashion, um, though I will mix it up on occasion with uh, students who understand that you can't shake an old guy too much because my brain fits more loosely in my head now. <laughs> well, we're, we're great to have such a polymath with us uh, this morning. And uh, we, we will accept you in your role as the good Reverend Craig Morrow for sure. So Craig, thank you, don't Craig. shake my head too much. <laughs> okay. We look forward to hearing from you more in a moment. But let's do take a few moments now this morning at the start of the service, as is our tradition, to greet one another. Say hi to those that you look forward to seeing each Sunday. Make some new friends today. If you're joining us for the first time, please don't be shy.
visit during social hour following our service, but we are going to move forward now by lighting our chalice, and Barbara Nelson is going to help light while I recite our usual words. The chalice is the symbol of our faith, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. For our opening reflection today, I'm going to um, cite a brief paragraph by Salman Rushdie from his uh, collection of essays in Imaginary Homelands in 1992. Those who oppose the novel most viciously today are of the opinion that intermingling with a different culture will inevitably weaken and ruin their own. I am of the opposite opinion. The Satanic Verses celebrates hybridity, impurity, intermingling, the transformation that comes of new and unexpected combinations of human beings, cultures, ideas, politics, movies, songs. It rejoices in mongrelization and fears the absolutism of the pure. Melange, hodgepodge, a bit of this and a bit of that is how newness enters the world. It is the great possibility that mass migration gives the world. The satanic verses is for change by fusion, change by conjoining. It is a love song for our mongrel selves. Well, we're going to do uh, the second hymn of the morning, a piece that the choir, when they were with us before COVID, did several times, and many of you, uh, it was a favorite for. Meditation on breathing. Uh, and it's easy to, to sing along, whether you're low voice or high. The low voices just say, breathe in, breathe out. The middle voices with the altos go, when I breathe in. All this will be on the screen. And then the higher voices come in too. So there's a, there's a part for everybody. And I think I'm going to let you stay seated for this one since it is a meditative song. And uh, just come along as you can. Thank you. 
We are now going to kindle our candles of care for those who are most, most on our hearts and minds this morning. I did not receive any specific request from within our congregation, but we'll begin as we have been for some time now with a candle on behalf of the people of Ukraine, as well as that region of the world that are being most impacted by the violence going on there. I also want to kindle a candle today for the Iranian people, particularly the Iranian rebels who are risking their lives, in some cases lost their lives, as they strive for what the human soul most needs, the ability to self-actualize, to freely express ourselves. It's something that we're going to be focusing on a lot in this service as we should as Unitarians. So a candle for the people of Iran. And let's do share a moment of silence, embracing others who are here or here in our hearts. And as always, you're welcome to name them aloud at this time if you'd like. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. And we now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which helps sustain this community and our mission to the larger world. we'd like to invite all of the children forward for our time for all ages. Are you ready to see who it is today? Do you have any guesses? Who? Who's your guess? It's not Grover. Grover? No. It's close. The green person? Purple? Purple. Yeah. 
close. It's close. I don't think this is someone you, you everybody here has met. So Maybe why don't we introduce met one of them. Eleonora Clunk, and you guys know Bun Bun, of course. Yes. Well, I'm so glad you invited me back to church, Dun Dun. Oh, he said he's so glad that you could come. In fact, earlier this week, he was telling me about how you came to his classroom to help with the harvest party. That's right. I love being with Dun Dun and his classmates. They're so much fun and such kind children. Were you harvesting from a garden? Well, not exactly. We were working on a food drive. Dun Dun's teacher explained that some animal families have a hard time finding food for their families, especially in the winter when it turns colder and it's hard to find fruits and grains and vegetables in nature. So we all got extras and put them in a little three pantry outside the school. And you know what? That sounds like something we have in our church. A little free pantry that's stocked with food products that people who need it can take and eat. Because as Unitarian Universalists, we believe in helping our neighbors, right? Yes, the answer is yes. yes. Yeah. It's not a trick question. <laughs> and one way we can do that is pro by providing food for people who are hungry. Well, isn't that wonderful? Dun dun. You didn't tell me about this. Well, he, he said it's kind of a new thing in our church, but his mom did read about it in the sun, and he's going to look for it today when he leaves. And, you know, the two of you talking about this harvest party at your school, Bun Bun, giving me an idea. I'm wondering if all of the grown-ups would be willing to bring in some canned and packaged food. I think that our children would be willing to help organize it and stock the pantry. What do you think? Yes, grown-ups, will you bring in some food? Yes. Okay, and kids, will you help me organize it in the pantry in a couple of weeks? All right, well then I'm going to help get us started because it just so happens, just coincidentally, I have two cans of pink, wild Alaskan pink salmon that we can put in the pantry. And uh, I don't think Peggy and I are going to eat it, so hopefully somebody who will like it can have it. So, oh, that's wonderful of you. And I have something in my own purse that I'd like to contribute. Would you get my purse, dear? Well, sure. Oh my gosh, this is a heavy purse. Oh, wow, very stylish, though. <laughs> and not really an old lady purse. And not an old lady no. purse. No, no. I I like to deal with it. I like to deal with it, you know. Now, now get my canned goods out of there, and I'd have to dig through it. Well, what's in it? Oh, just the essentials, you know, for a lady's purse. Okay, that's a weed eater filter. Well, you never know when you're going to need one. No. And uh, let's see what what. This looks like a Bigfoot statue. That's right, of course. <laughs> Don't leave home without one. No. Okay. And what is this? Uh, oh no, that's a nose, put it on. No, no, not on me, on yourself. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, the, the, the outfit is complete. Yes, it is. All right, why is this in your purse? Well, you never know when you not need a little hand. <laughs> I do look funny in that. And, 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 and what is this? Well, in case I have a dome to take with somebody. Of course. I do look like a clown. And, and, and what, 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 why do you have a big rock in your purse? Well, it ought to be as obvious as the nose on your face. Yeah, it is about as obvious as that. So I don't see any keys or, or a wallet in here. Well, I don't have room for everything. No, of course not. <laughs> Ah, here it is. Yes, that's it. Some canned vegetables. Well, canned vegetables can, to go in the food Definitely. pantry. Thank you, Ella. You're very generous, and thanks for letting us dig into your very interesting but hip purse. <laughs> yes, thank you, Eleanor. I'm going to let you repack all of these, except for maybe the bone. Do you think that somebody might enjoy that bone for their Oh, dog? yes, they're very tasty. I think or so. Or so I'm told. <laughs> so I need some volunteers. Max, will you? Max? <laughs> Will you take the bone? And then can I have somebody take the corn? Thanks, Theo. Perfect. 
And then who would like to carry the salmon? Zuri, there's one for you. And then there's one for someone else. Thanks, Emma. All right. You don't want to give that to Emma. They're Perfect. going to they're going to go to the food pantry exactly. right now. Exactly. So we're going to put oh those in a bin in the foyer, and I invite all of you to bring some other packaged and canned food items next week to put in that foyer, and then kids will put it in the actual pantry in two Sundays on October 23rd. Okay. Oh yes, Bun Bun wants to know if he can help. And yes, Bun Bun, you definitely can. Oh, wonderful. Well, thanks for being here, Eleonora. And thanks to both of you for giving me the idea of getting our kids involved in helping our neighbors. Yeah, very welcome. What's that? Can you do the gong? Yeah, go, go ahead. We, uh, the service wouldn't be the same if you didn't do our gong. <laughs> so professionally. Oh, perfect. Thank you. All right. All right. Please join us now in singing our children to Children's Chapel. Huh? You want the clown nose? Eleonora is a very fun character getting to know. She, she tones it down a bit for church, I've got to tell you. <laughs> okay, for our meditation today, I'm going to uh, offer a, a couple more sentences uttered by Salman Rushdie uh, for you to reflect upon. One, again, from imaginary homelands, and the other from... Uh, outside the Well, you know, that was published in 1984, 1984 uh, in homage to George Orwell's essay, which was called Inside the Well. George Orwell was very pessimistic about uh, authoritarianism, and Salman Rushdie has a, a bit of a different perspective about how we should respond to it. So he wasn't as hope he's not as hopeless as maybe Orwell's writings do. So that's the background. So first from imaginary homelands. What is freedom of expression? Without the freedom to offend, it ceases to exist. And from outside the well, it matters, it always matters to name rubbish as rubbish. To do otherwise is to legitimize it. And I'll now invite Reverend Craig to offer this morning's reading. He continues to be one of the guiding beacons in our world, really. Well, Jalal Uddin Rumi, another beacon in our world, was born in the year 1207 in a town in today's Tajikistan and died in 1273 in Konya, now in Turkey, has been the most popular poet in the United States since at least 2007. His poem, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, was set to music by my colleague Lynn Unger, and it's now one of our favorite hymns. But here's how it sounds in the, in the original Persian, which you probably haven't heard before. <clears throat> 
بازا بازا هران چه هستی بازا گر کافر او گابر او بلد پرستی بازا این درگه ما درگه نوم دینیست صد بار اگر تو به شکستی بازا بازا means come on come on Iranian friend has told me that his dad used to say come on come on بازا بازا رومی also wrote many prose essays which are less familiar to us than his poetry Here's a passage from one of them. In God's world, there is nothing more difficult than enduring the ridiculous. Suppose, for instance, you've read a certain book, corrected, amended, and fully vocalized it. Now, vocalized means to put the vowels in. Languages that use Arabic script, like Persian and Arabic, often write words as strings of consonants without the vowels. It's like seeing the letters S, N, G, and having to determine from context whether we're reading sing, sang, sung, or song. Okay, so you've gone through all this work of struggling sincerely with a book, and then, then someone sitting beside you reads that book all wrongly. Can you endure that? No, it's impossible. If, however, you've not read the book, it makes no difference to you whether the other person reads it wrongly or reads it right. You cannot distinguish wrong from right. So, enduring the ridiculous is a great discipline. Hence the title of my sermon. Well, a sense of humor can help you with this, but sometimes when people seem committed to misreading and misunderstanding what you write or attacking you for what they say it says when they haven't even read it. A sense of humor can be difficult to maintain. I'll try to summon as much of mine as possible for the story that follows while we sing hymn number 188, or while the choir sings number 188, Come, come, whoever you are. Bozo, bozo, haranche hasti. Thank you so much, choir. That's a beautiful arrangement, really. Well, a book fills the news. The whole world focuses on a single text with which few have read it all, let alone read it correctly. People demanding that it be banned worldwide or killed in a riot. There are more riots in more countries, more deaths almost every day. Then the head of a religious state who hasn't read the book issues a death threat against its author. Millions of dollars and a place in heaven are promised to whoever will kill him. Some bookstores remove the book from their shelves. Two bookstores are bombed in Berkeley, California, home of the free speech movement. Soon, authors and free speech advocates also take to the streets with a sense of mission. 
all for a book and what it means to write one. What kind of book is this? It's a book of imagination, building on, drawing from, and playing with history and its fiction. It's a book, like most books, by an author. This author's name is Salman Rushdie. The book is called The Satanic Verses. The year is 1989. Supporters of free speech carry signs, or they wear buttons that say, I am Salman Rushdie, to show support for both the author and this sacred freedom. 1,400 years earlier, another book had filled the news. There were fewer kinds of media then, gossip, sarcastic poetry, catcalls, whispers, but the controversy sparked by this book dominated them all. The book and its readers were detested by those who claimed that it was wrong, bad, insulting. It harmed them by simply existing, whether they read it or not. Death threats were also made against the man most closely associated with it and against his supporters. They suffered economic sanctions, social bans, and cancellations. What kind of book was this one? It's a book believed to have no human author. Instead, it's made known by a messenger relaying a message. That messenger's name was Muhammad, and the book is called the Qur'an. The Qur'an is not Muhammad's book. For Islam, its words are not words inspired by God, but God's own exact words, holy speech. Every sentence, every word. The prophet simply shares his holy speech with the people. Muslims believe that God spoke his messages to the archangel Gabriel, who next spoke them to Muhammad, who then spoke them to the world. So here's the chain of transmission. God, angel, prophet, people. Straightforward. But there's another angel, a fallen angel in Islam, just as there is in Christian, in Christian tradition. His name is sometimes given as Shaitan or Satan, or sometimes it's Iblis. Once God's favorite, he was cast from God's presence for defying God's word. That happened when God ordered all the angels to bow before his final creation, human beings, us. This angel was the only one who refused on the grounds that angels were created from light, but these human things were made from clay or mud. Did you tell me to bow to that? To one of those mud things? Ew! And so he lost his angel job and became a devil. Now he's very jealous and he's also very resourceful. He wants to strike back at these muddy upstarts whom he blames for his downfall. How can he knock them down a peg? Why not attack God's chain of transmission and maybe mess up the still incoming Quran? Obviously, he can't get to God or Gabriel. The weak link in the chain is Muhammad, a big-hearted human being who wants so much to help his neighbors out of their confusion and distress over the daily crisis atmosphere of a profoundly unjust society. As a former angel himself, Satan is able to speak words that sound like Gabriel's. So speaking once more in his old angel accent, he slips some new verses to the prophet. They sound like this. Now, different Arabic sounds from Persian. These are the high flying cranes and their intercession is acceptable. That's what they mean. The high-flying cranes and their intercession is acceptable. These words which the prophet repeats to the crowds are also real crowd pleasers since they seem to permit worship of some of the old Arabian gods as feather-winged helpers of Allah, the author of the Quran. This is the story of the satanic verses as reported by generations of early authors whose Islamic credentials were considered impeccable. Did it really happen? Who knows? We don't have a time machine. True or not, it's important to understand that tradition counts this story to Muhammad's credit, and so does God. 
He quickly sends down new Quran verses, quote, making light of the affair, and assures Muhammad that, it's the, that the same thing had happened to other prophets like Jesus. He says, the, the, law, the Quran says, we've not sent a messenger or a prophet before you, but when he longed, Satan cast suggestions into his longing. But God will annul what Satan has suggested. Then God will place his own verses right where they belong. So God is saying to Muhammad, don't worry. This whole mess just serves to show that you are a real prophet. <clears throat> That's what happens to him. So Salman Rushdie did not invent the story of the satanic verses. Instead, he made use of it in a powerfully imaginative novel that begins with two men falling together through the sky from an exploding jetliner. As they fall, they have conversations, they have arguments. One of these characters will become more and more deranged as the story progresses. He will murder the woman he loves, then at last take his own life. The scenes in the novel which draw from the traditional story of the satanic verses in fact, all of the passages in the book that were deemed offensive take place in this sick man's mind. It's a difficult book to read. But if you conclude that such a tortured character's delusions are the book's real message, then, to use Rumi's words, you've read it all wrongly. If you insist on your conclusion and do so without having read the book at all, then, to use Rumi's words again, you are being ridiculous. Unfortunately, being ridiculous never seems to stop anyone from also being violent. In 1990, Salman Rushdie looked back at a year of reactions to the book, including the fatwa pronounced against him by the Ayatollah Khomeini. I did everything that I could, using literary devices, to make clear to any reader that I was not attempting to falsify history, but to allow fiction to take off from history. The use of dreams was intended to say, the point is not whether this is really supposed to be Muhammad or whether the satanic verses incident really happened. The use of fiction was a way of creating the sort of distance from actuality that I felt would prevent offense from being taken. I was wrong. Boy, was he wrong. Rushdie was trying to present something of real value to everyone who would take the time to actually read it, and read it carefully. After four years of writing, his book had been carefully vetted by editors, reviewers, and publishers, none of whom foresaw the reaction that was coming. Nothing like it had ever happened before. Boy, were they surprised. Rusty went into hiding. Many bookstores were bombed and several translators were killed or seriously injured. I don't need to tell you what happened to him just last month. But anyway, this blowback onto the other people, this should be no surprise if we've read the words of Ayatollah Khomeini's fatwa. I am informing all brave Muslims of the world that the author of the Satanic Verses, a text written, edited, and published against Islam, the Prophet of Islam and the Qur'an, along with all the editors and publishers aware of its contents, are condemned to death. I call on all valiant Muslims, wherever they may be in the world, to kill them without delay, so that no one will dare insult the sacred beliefs of Muslims henceforth. He also promises a place in heaven, place in heaven, to whoever carries out such murders. You'll notice that the Ayatollah does not share a single word or idea of Rushdie's to support his claims of harm to Islam. Well, he's a theocratic ruler from a backward country, we said. All this rage is being generated in places that had no tradition of what we would call free speech. We thought such things could never happen in countries like ours. Or if they did, it could only be in certain backward or rural or southern communities. We would never have thought that it could happen in a liberal, highly literate setting. We thought it must be impossible 
in communities that go by the name Unitarian Universalist. Boy, were we wrong. Fast forward from 1989 to 2019, and another book fills the news at the UU, UUA General Assembly in Spokane, Washington, right where you are. The Reverend Todd Edcloff, minister of the Spokane Church, puppeteer, guy you know, begins to distribute a book he's written that's called The Gadfly Papers, Three Inconvenient Essays by One Pesky Minister. One essay called Let's Be Reasonable, challenges some ideas about race and white supremacy that have become very popular during the daily crisis atmosphere of Donald Trump's presidency, when many liberals are feeling frightened, angry, and confused. Todd wants, like Muhammad, Todd wants to help us deal with our confusion. So he subjects some claims made in a popular book by the UUA's Beacon Press and written by a white millionaire who trains the employees of white billionaire bosses about their inherent racial fragility to rigorous logical examination and finds that they fall short of the standards of reasonable discourse. He questions whether such poorly grounded claims will help or hinder the cause of free and open dialogue about racial justice. He asks whether it is reasonable to characterize UU churches as bastions of white supremacy like the Ku Klux Klan. Just as God counts the Satanic Verses event to Muhammad's credit, Todd credits us with being much better people. Todd credits us with being much better people than the white corporate trainer and certain UU leaders would make us out to be. On the same day that Todd's book appears, and before almost anyone would have had time to actually read it, the attacks begin. In less than two days, a letter circulates on social media and is sent out by the UUMA, the UU, UU Ministers Association, to all members. All these attacks begin. The, the, the letter con condemns his use of reason and logic as tools of white supremacy. Reason and logic as tools of white supremacy. But here's the cover note that accompanied the letter. Some of you may have seen the letter, but only ministers would have seen the cover note. You use, please take a moment and read this letter signed by more than 300 white UU ministers in response to one of our own colleagues publishing and distributing a racist, transphobic, sexist treatise while we were at General Assembly. It's one of many responses, and they all declare that the views espoused in this publication are not representative of who we want to be as you use. Read these, these responses, but do not go out and purchase this book out of curiosity. Trust the hundreds of people who have seen it, especially our siblings of color and trans kin who have been hurt by this. It's bad. Read the objections to the book but do not read the book itself. Put thoughtful curiosity aside and join in condemnation. Trust what I assert about people being hurt, but do not try to verify my assertions. This is essentially an incitement to virtual mob action, though some of these colleagues did step out of the virtual realm and try to physically seize and destroy copies of the book at GA. The signers of this fatwa-style letter blatantly violated the UU Ministers Association Code of Professional Practice that was in effect at the time, which clearly states, quote, I will stand in a supportive relation to my colleagues and keep for them an open mind and heart. I will not speak scornfully or in derogation of any colleague in public. In any private conversation critical of a colleague, I will speak responsibly and temperately. Another guideline urges ministers to directly contact any colleague with whom they might have a serious issue. And yet the UUMA, instead of calling for balanced discussion, threw its full weight behind the mob screaming, crucify, if you'll pardon me for using an Easter metaphor, not just after Easter, but also even after Labor Day. None of them were brave enough 
kind enough, or even curious enough to contact Todd directly. They attacked him without asking questions. He was expelled from membership in our professional association, then removed from ministerial fellowship, or excommunicated, if you will, by a committee whose chairperson had signed the fatwa letter. All of this without ever citing a single passage or examining a single idea from the book that they condemned, but that most had never even read. It was enough to assert harm without describing where or when or how the book had done such harm. Todd had challenged their sacred beliefs. A challenge to truth claims, it seems, is now the same as violence. New Ministers Association guidelines created to justify the mob's actions define, quote, challenging a person's perceptions, opinions, and thoughts as bullying and emotional abuse. Challenging perceptions, opinions, and thoughts is bullying and emotional abuse. The author of the letter's introductory note said, that the note that said, don't read the book, just trust me that it's bad, that author, rather than facing sanctions for uncollegial behavior, was rewarded, or so I infer from the sequence of events, with a paid position at the UUA's Siding with Love office. Yes, I said the Siding with Love office, almost like being a given a place in heaven. What was it that Rumi said about enduring the ridiculous? Here it is again. In God's world, there's nothing more difficult than enduring the ridiculous. Suppose you've read a certain book, corrected, amended, vocalized it, then someone sitting beside you reads that book all wrongly. Can you endure that? No, it's impossible. If, however, you have not read the book, it makes no difference to you whether the other person reads it wrongly or reads it right. You cannot distinguish wrong from right. So, enduring the ridiculous is a great discipline. If it's ridiculous to make assertions about a book that you have read carelessly, how much more ridiculous it is to attack an author for a book that you haven't read at all. Perhaps now I'm being ridiculous, but I think that free speech goes beyond being a simple right for most of us, or something that we merely value. It's something sacred. I mean this freedom itself as much as what we express when exercising it. I trust that most of us value freedom of speech and expression and will fight hard in order to preserve them. Just remember that this fight comes with risks as we re review the Ayatollah's death sentence and recall how it wasn't just for Rushdie. Quote, the author of the satanic verses, along with all the editors and publishers aware of its contents, are condemned to death. All of them. Everyone who helps bring a book to readers or readers to a book. That's the way these ayatollahs are. Dealing out death, whether it's professional or physical, so deathly certain that they're the ones who are siding with the only sacred beliefs that are truly righteous and holy. Shortly after the Gadfly, Gadfly papers came out and the fatwas came raining down, many colleagues rallied to Todd's defense. Remember that there are roughly 1,800 UU ministers total, most of whom did not sign the letter that the good Reverend Side with Love had circulated. They've tried to create this impression that most ministers agreed with that's not the case. We called for dialogue, for patience and restraint, and I think we also spoke for love, not just siding with him, but trying to actually practice it. For that, we were accused of complicity with racism, homophobia, etc., etc., etc. When a group of us at last resigned in protest from our professional organization, some of our colleagues banned us from speaking again in their pulpits. I had just signed a contract to speak to a neighboring congregation where I'd been invited many times, over 20 years, and I'd already written the sermon. And just before my visit, I was told that my talk had been canceled. The contract be damned. 
Later, two former ministers of the congregation that I served until retiring this summer posted online messages implying that those of us who resigned from the UUMA oppose racial justice and promising that we would not be allowed to attend future collegial events or to use the colleagues' chat line to post about things like best practices for hiring an administrator or how to use Zoom. I responded, sending them contact information for our worship committee, my church, and an invitation to please come visit us again when they could. What these ministers have done is shameful. And I won't name them here because I still follow our old collegial guidelines, the ones that were rational, the ones that were kind. People, new use have never acted like this before, canceling, censoring, and punishing each other for differences of approach or opinion. It's just not who we are. We're supposed to represent the best parts of religion, not the worst ones, like dividing people between the children of God who deserve heaven even when they commit murder, and the children of Satan who deserve hell even when they do their best to tell the truth. For the past three years, I've seen UU values turned upside down and backwards. I stood outside GA this year with Todd and others, wearing one button that said, I am Salman Rushdie, and one that said, I am Todd Ekloff. I also wore what I always wear when I preach, a badge that says, Reverend Craig Morrow. I wore it ridiculously upside down, like flags are flown upside down only as signs of extreme distress and danger. One year after his world turned upside down, Salman Rushdie wrote, I feel as if I've been plunged like Alice into the world beyond the looking glass, where nonsense is the only available sense. Please understand, however, I make no complaint. I am a writer. I do not accept my condition. I will strive to change it, but I inhabit it trying to learn from it. Our lives teach us who we are. Letter by letter, line by line, fully vocalizing our sacred freedom of speech and our active love of the truth, may our lives always do just that. Teach us who we are. Right here, right now, and in all the days to come. So may it be. Please rise for our closing hymn. It was also chosen by Reverend Morrow. It's number 148, Let Freedom Span Both East and West.
Thanks so much to Reverend Craig for such a rich message this morning and for joining us. I'm going to set up my laptop up here after the service for those who might want to come and say a word or two to him while he's still on Zoom. If he's still on Zoom with us, I think he is. It's been a long day for him though, so he won't be on there for long. But for our closing benediction, I'm going to cite one more sentence from Saman Rushdie in his 1993 talk with David Frost. I do not envy people who think they have a complete explanation of the world for the simple reason that they are obviously wrong. <laughs> Peace, shalom, salam alaikum, namaste, amen. Mm -hmm.